All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 30th of January, 2024, Open Research Institute's FPGA Meetup. Uh, what we do is we talk about what we've done over the past, uh, what we have scheduled to work over the next little bit, and um, if we have any particular roadblocks or if we have anything um, that you know that that we need in terms of resources. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and talk about uh, a report from from Anshul Makar, and he says he's sorry he won't be able to attend today due to some personal work. Uh, he's exploring MATLAB with respect to the uh, HDL coder um, uh, toolbox that we have available, and he has tried the satellite communications examples that are given in MATLABs. So these are examples from from MathWorks, and he says all good. Uh, he's working on making the uh, analog devices loop back examples to work. Uh, he has a, I believe, an ADRV 9371 uh, on site. So he's going to try to integrate the DVBS2 encoder again on the 9371 that worked in the past, um, but there were some issues. And then he has a report about another project. Um, and he's, he's, he's doing well. So he's going to steam ahead with that. Um, with respect to the ADRV 9371, this was a, a really great chip, but the 9009 and 9002 are what we're using in Remote Lab West. Um, and if we have any sort of station or any sort of um, equipment from Remote Lab South, which we're, we're looking to go ahead and, and liquidate, uh, then I think that maybe directing the additional equipment, if there's anything that, that works for him better than the 9371, uh, making sure that Anshul has it for a remote lab in the in India, remote lab India, that, that might be something that we should consider. All right, so that's Anshul's report. It, it's good that he's making progress with the with MATLAB. HDL coder is the is the way that we turn like Simulink and MATLAB code into um, freely usable, as in, you know, it's uh, it's not just architecture agnostic code, uh, but free for you to use and publish. So this is great for us. Um, it's good that he's making progress with that because it can be kind of complicated and there's lots of steps along the way, as you've seen in probably the Neptune updates. Um, so so good news. All right, so that that's uh, that's what he has to to report. Um, so let's go ahead and go to go to Paul if you have anything to share about Remote Lab West. I think there's nothing to say. It's software update was reported last week, I believe, and it's uh, not caused any problems that I'm aware of yet. So things are cruising along. I don't have anything uh, to report on personal development work and no instant plans for uh, for any either. I'll be helping Michelle with whatever she needs and. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll get to transmit something. <laughs> yeah. No, I know we have some. Uh, I know we have some like toy demonstrations, um, and and some some work that we're trying to do for Opulent Voice in the lab. So I know that we are actually transmitting something. Um, you know, but it's pretty pretty early on. Uh, but yeah, thank you for all your help. And at tomorrow's uh, Neptune meetup. Oh, there's a there's a lot more to report about Neptune, which is hev heavily leveraging all of the uh, stations in in Remote Lab West. So thank you very much for your support on that. Okay, so I'll I'll pass it off to to Ken, who's uh, working on over on the ADRV 9009 for Hyperia and trying to integrate a polyphase folder bank on the receive side. So it's all you. Okay, um, I've finish the uh, wrapper for the most part, uh, except one aspect uh, is the stream interface. AXI stream is what our, we, we have just some FIFOs uh, that get written using the stream interface. I need to port that to more directly connect up to the uh, ADI references uh, AXI4 fabric. Um, so looking at the, the difference, it looks like it should map over pretty pretty straightforward. I'm checking, was trying to check to see the um, some other examples within the reference design for 
there's a few signals that basically get stubbed out and get tied off. I want to make sure that like the response signal on tying okay and the valid. So I, I'm navigating through the, the blocks right now to try and get it all uh, converted over. And I think at that point, um, just a couple edits to the tickle should stitch in that block, the, the polyphase filter block. So yeah, today focused on the getting this AXI uh, ported over to the conventional AXI as opposed to stream. So that's all I have. Okay, so just just so I understand the 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 challenge right now is like there's a, a an AXI light, which is the interface that we usually use back to the processor. So the, that's an interface that you want to use for for things like the um, configuration updates or or you know low uh, low frequency communications with the polyphase filter bank, like setting it up in the first place. And then the the AXI stream interface would be for the the actual data stream. You know. So and uh oh. I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, the uh Polyphase uh, filter source has a stream interface for the data plane, but it's also got streaming interface for mask and uh, co uh, coefficients for the uh, the filter that have to get, uh, you basically configure the block. Um, so conventionally you want that to be AXI, like just memory mapped AXI. Um, but it's currently in the stream format. So I need to, it looks pretty straightforward as far as I can tell. Um, so I just need to convert that. I'm basically going to edit the uh, polyphase source to, but like I say, it's for the most part, I think it's simply signal name changes. Um, yeah. That's. Okay, so there's a couple of there's a couple of different ways to do this. So, so we can edit the the code that's produced by the the automated system from Theseus cores, and then that becomes static code, and the, the our recipe then that we own it, like we own that particular cut uh, from the or or we could potentially go all the way back to the Theseus cores server, and then it would produce. Um, you know, for the for the configuration registers, we would have uh, AXI light, and it would not use, and it would a do AXI stream for everything. Like like we could go back further upstream and and make this, uh, you know. So that's this is one option. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, I do have a wrapper, so I may be able. If it's simply signal name changes, I can. For the most part, change it in there. The the ADI the reference design, I'm not even sure if it's light. Uh, it's it's got the full AXI form. It say it has these macros that you call in the uh, tickle to do these uh, memory inter or AXI interconnects. And uh, as near as I can tell, those blocks are full AXI. Um, so there's just some extra signals that get tied off, and I want to make sure that we're tying, like when you call this macro, I want to make sure that the block at least has a stub for the signals that the macros are expecting to see. So that's really what I'm just, I'm trying to compare what the block currently looks like, which is really just, it has ready, valid, and uh, data. And what what are the bare, the subset, in order for the tickle macros to uh, play well with this block, what does it need to see at least? You know, the outputs will just be tied off for the most part, but I, I do need to present them to the. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that the full suite, because there is a lot of signals uh, for, that go into the AXI with a full spec that at least you have to be aware for, for the macro to get 
invoked correctly. So, okay. Does does Theseus cores pretty much use AXI stream for everything? Yes, for the polyphase filter at least. I haven't looked at their other source. Okay, that's a lot of really good work. Thank you. Um, looking forward to seeing it run. And uh, at this point, once you edit that tackle script that's at the board common level and the HDL uh, reference design, then we should get some useful errors from <laughs> from the project creation and, and then be able to open up the board uh, file, the .bd file, and actually see the uh, our custom IP in the block diagram. And that's always, to me at least, a, a big a big step forward. So it sounds like we're really close to to doing that. Um, okay, so it's, it sounds good. Uh, is there anything that you need or that, like you don't have that you need? Uh, and is there any anything blocking your way? No, I you know I find it somewhat confusing going through the GitHub for the uh, analog devices and trying to just find the source for these things, but maybe. A few more minutes. I know you've steered me towards that in the past. I think I've seen, but now I'm trying to just strike off into these other blocks and and just look at, at a reference. I can't seem to find like the source that I want to, but uh, that's minor. I'll, I'll maybe just offline talk. With you. Okay. No, it sounds like that might need like a, either a page or mention in in the on our working with FPGAs markdown because. Anytime that you use a reference design from somebody else, there they have stipulations or axioms, really, like unquestioned assumptions about the way that it's set up and the way that the analog devices reference design for their RFICs is set up is, is that you navigate through a directory hierarchy that serves lots of different FPGAs and, and a multitude of their RFICs. And, and they've pulled back at, at different levels in the hierarchy, like like here's the Tekel script that takes care of the FPGA board, and here's a Tekel script that is called for this particular RFIC. And in the very end, at the very ends of the leaves, then here's a Tekel script or here's the make file. And the source code is there, but it's you do have to kind of dig in. So it sounds like we might need to have like a little explainer, maybe like a two minute video that that with screenshots that shows like, okay, if you're looking for the source code for like CPAC, which is what you were looking for, I think a week or two ago, then where would you find the source code for CPAC? And, you know, at least on the transmitter side, when we're trying to implement the DVB S2 encoder, we have had to go look at the source code to figure out this one signal that like, where does it go? It doesn't seem to match up with anything. And you can't just skip over with a signal and just connect it back up after you've in inserted some IP, there's all sorts of timing issues that might happen with that. So we had to solve that problem and we had to go look at the source code. And I remember it being a little confusing. So I'll take it as an action, like to come up with an explainer for like where, like how is the ADI reference design, that HDL reference design laid out? If they don't have a page somewhere that says this, I'll go look uh, to see if they do. Um, then we'll do a real quick one just as a from a user perspective rather than a publisher uh, perspective. So I'll I'll take that as an action. We should be able to get that into the into the YouTube pretty quick. But thank you so much for all your work. Uh, the polyphase filter is hugely useful, and uh, I think we'll 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 be it'll there'll be a lot of interest. You know, not just from from us for what we're doing for this particular application. But having a reference design from from ADI that has a polyphase filter bank on the receiver, I think will be of interest to a lot of people just just right at that level. Like none of our additional blocks, but just here, hey, would you like to have an accessible polyphase filter multi-rate receiver, you know, with this reference design uh, would be a big step step up. Uh, so so gotten some positive feedback there with people interested in just like, oh, how does that work? Can you can you publish that? And the, the answer is, of course, yes. But, um, you know, we'll we'll surface that work as soon as we can. So it sounds like we're really close to that that step. Uh, and, and thank you very much for, for all of your hard work.
Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, Matthew. If you have any any uh, comments or advice or directions or questions, uh, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. No, I don't have anything uh, to report or uh, today. Um, still just trying to keep up and, and come up to speed with some of the stuff. Um, mostly, uh, you know, listening in and just gathering things where I can. So keep with that. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, we definitely appreciate you being here. All right. Hey, Rick, uh, any uh, FPGA questions or any sort of advice for our multi-rate implementation? Uh, you can see how we're we're doing here. No, I'm just finally checking in. I always seem to have a conflict when you have this meeting. And in fact, I had I was on the on another meeting with the QT representative uh, just now at the same time, but I killed that one. I just wanted to see how you're going because you're you're going uh, you're doing the same things I want to do, but not the way I want to do them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, variety yeah. is the spice of life. So we <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to help you in in, in some small way. Uh, you know, without MATLAB, because uh, the oh yeah, the MATLAB is over on Neptune, so there's no MATLAB involved here with uh, uh with Hyper IEA. So you're safe. Yeah. You're safe from MATLAB here. <laughs> uh, the, the issues you ran into with MATLAB are issues I'd already run into before, and that's why I killed the whole idea. Oh, good. Okay, that that actually is reassuring. Um, <laughs> I don't you know, know, right? Like it's always a, <laughs> it's always nice to hear like it's not all you, you know. Uh, but we right. have pa we've powered through with a lot of different issues with using HDL coder. So if you're interested in that, then check out the the Wednesday meetups for Neptune. We're we're grinding through with extreme prejudice and not accepting yeah. defeat and all that sort of stuff on and we you know there is a path forward, but there's some lots of compromises and and lots of quirks. So, you know, um yeah, you, everything you've you, everything you've experienced is totally valid and it's uh it, it's it's interesting. But yeah, Neptune is the one using the HDL coder. Uh we we have not yet used HDL coder for for this particular project for the for the uh, five and dime uh, transponder for hyper uh, If there comes a point where it looks like it would help us, we would use it. But but so far, uh, we're we're using uh, Theseus cores and uh, Swato's DBBS2 encoder work, uh, and then the rest of it is probably going to be in um, you know in the general purpose processor in the Zinc to to manage uh, you know targeted HDL uh, stuff for the. Uh, essentially for the multiplexing and for the protocol management in, inside the payload. So, you know, unless there comes a point where it looks like HDL coder would help us on this particular project, then we, we won't use it. Uh, but we've committed to using HDL coder for Neptune. So that's a, we're get, we're learning a lot. We're going to share all of that. Uh, and I'm, I would of course be very interested in, in uh, hearing about your experiences with, with MATLAB and why you chose to depart from it. That would be, that would be that would help uh, the the eventual uh, white paper on this. Actually, I think you've already learned exactly the same lessons I learned. Uh, that first of all, I I was trying to do something that might have commercial value at that time, and therefore I was looking at paying the real prices for these things. And I discovered that for every module I wanted, there were five more modules that I had to buy. And if I wasn't uh, extremely wealthy and could afford to buy literally all the modules they had, uh, I, you know, it, it was just out of the question. But that was only one thing. Uh, the other thing was a lack of flexibility whatever I wanted to do wasn't something they'd already done. And therefore, there wasn't an easy path through their uh, tools to get to an FPGA. And during that same period, the, the toolkits provided by the FPGA manufacturers, their own toolkits, became better and better uh, to the point where they had pretty much everything I needed. 
uh, to get my project, you know, working. And so I like that idea. That, that was. Yeah. No, I I think I clearly hear you. the 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 toolbox dependencies are, um, are an issue, and and they they come up in every MATLAB workshop that I've ever been to. With people that actually are using MATLAB in industry, will come to these workshops and they'll say, "Look, it's great that you have an ML or an AI or a motor or whatever toolbox, but now I have to buy five or six more to get that to work." And I think we can see this on the RF and communication side, where it's not just the communications toolbox, but it's the DSP toolbox, and then an RF toolbox, and then a wireless toolbox, and an LTE toolbox that ordinary mortals can't get, and so on. And so the dependencies are look like they're designed to get you to buy a whole bunch of stuff. You can't just have communications with the communications toolbox. Yeah. And that's a that's an issue. So they and that's 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 been told to them uh, a lot. Uh, but you can sort of see as a commercial enterprise that why they would want to do it that way. The lack of flexibility is a is a real deal. So when we talk about HDL toolbox uh, or hardware descriptive language toolbox, which is the one that converts Simulink models and MATLAB code into HDL, it's extremely powerful. And yes, the code's good quality. It's human readable. It's free to use. This is this is a big step forward. However. If you want that to happen, then the the blocks that you use in Simulink are limited to the library, to the libraries that are approved, that are that are already pre-programmed or pre prepared to to be used in HDL coder. So you you pretty much say, okay, the entire Simulink library. If you're familiar with Simulink, it's a library of blocks that you then drag and drop over to the to the canvas. Um, then just forget all of the other ones. You just really need to look at the ones that are that are HDL coder or DSP HDL coder approved. Now, right. these are really useful blocks, sure, but it's a very, very small subset. I haven't looked in and counted up. Uh, there's a whole ton of blocks in Simulink. It's a huge tool that, that does all sorts of different things, like uh, lots of different industries and math and, and everything. It's very powerful, but there's a pretty small fraction of these blocks that HDL coder will consume. So if you put in a block that isn't an HDL coder block, who knows what will happen? It may reject it or the code might be weird or it just sits there and fails. So, but, so there, in order to reduce pain, like never fight the tool is a rule that we have here at ORI, like don't fight the tool. So go along with the tool, like use the libraries from HDL coder and yeah you end up with a lack of flexibility you you lose uh, all of this capability from simulink that you have with all of these other libraries I, I honestly don't remember how many there are but if you look in the library chooser there's a ton of different blocks um, now you still can use the matlab function block so it's a block that you get to put matlab code in and that actually it does the matlab code inside of a wrapper for HDL coder. So there is a way out, uh, but it requires you to do this work in MATLAB and test it all yourself. So you don't get to just grab stuff off the shelf. So that's that's the one bright spot here from this thing. And and yeah, you're right, FPGA, FPGA tool, toolkits and, and frameworks uh, from, from other companies, other sources are, are getting really pretty pretty good so there is there's options that are in vivado and there's an open source option or several open source options like you can go uh and and find uh white quarks work uh through python um that was you know we did a, a whole newsletter on the wonderful sdr uh, maya uh, from dr estefes um that leveraged uh this work and and it's it's a functional, wonderful FPGA deployment on the on the Pluto uh, that gives you an extremely powerful, um, essentially spectrum analyzer um, with a with a web interface. So you just have to have a browser, and you see a super fast, wonderful representation of your spectrum. So if if those open source tools and and also the closed source stuff from from companies. Um, you know, can can come up to this level or exceed it, then then you can see what will happen. So our yeah. expo exploration <laughs> here is like to learn how to do this, to produce the design, yes, but also to give feedback to tools designers 
and the open source community to say, here's the good and the bad of like HDL Coder and MATLAB. Make sure that your open source ice pack, you know, which works on, you know, the ice, like ice storm, ice pack, those sorts of things, ICE, the, the, that whole brand, like, like, hey, here's here's what it actually is like to use these tools. And there are a lot of good aspects to it. There's things that are super convenient and then there's things that are not. So that's that's kind of the, when you step back from the actual, like, oh, produce the design, get a Neptune, you know, working project. The experience of using uh, the MATLAB HDL coder, we want to reassure open source tools designers. We want to inform them of like what it, what capabilities are worth it and where what are the advantages and disadvantages of closed source tools where do you stack up where do you go from here that's also part of what we do yeah well yes and i i basically divided my projects that would have used matlab and simulink into two categories I'm doing some work with Western Telescope up at Haystack, and that's all done, being done now in Python. I like that because it's free and open source, and there's lots and lots and lots of libraries that are showing up every day, and they're pretty good. And But they don't do FPGAs, but they solve a lot of my other large data problems. And the FPGA stuff, I'm just struggling through uh, with Movado and, you know, those tool kits that are available. The one you mentioned about Pluto, I, I need to find that one because my Pluto project disappeared. Unfortunately, that company had other, I, I think they got bought out and they had other issues. So I've now got a couple of Plutos. I am looking for a good use for them. <laughs> Maybe... I have a spectrum analyzer, but I'd like to have a little portable one. So I got to find that code and try it. Okay, I've got a solution for you, and I'll put it here in the show notes uh, so that other folks can find it too. I highly recommend the the Maya SDR by by Dr. Estefas uh, for Pluto, and it's uh, it's fantastic. Uh, so there's been a number of of presentations about it. Uh, so 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 once you have the uh, uh, the link to the to the project page. Um, it should be pretty easy to find some 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 presentations and and other other work about it. And you can always go back and look at our newsletter that talked about uh, talked about Maya SDR, M A I A uh, dash SDR. Okay. So yeah, that's what we'll, we'll we'll we're very happy to to uh, to help and promote that particular project. It's great. Okay, so in closing, any last comments or questions before we uh, After shut? You close. After you close, I have a comment. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll move to office hours after the the meeting. All right, so so anybody that's following along, uh, greetings from from Open Research Institute. You can find out more about us at openresearch.institute on the web, and if you put go look at the getting started page, uh, it's how to to join up and to stay involved in all of our projects. If you have a project that that uh, you would like uh, some some support and help with, we're that's what we're here for. Um, and if you are an individual looking for a project, we have a bunch on offer. So thanks everybody. See you on Slack and next week at the same time. <laughs>